glad to be in God's house tonight. Praise God. Looking forward to what God's going to do right here in this service. I pray the Lord let the spirit of revival just keep on going. Praise God. Let's all stand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
glad that one day he's coming back for a group of people that have made themselves ready. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
what he does is good. Good. Good.
He said for us to be a sweet smell and savor before him. And he loves the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. So he pours out his spirit to marinate us. And we must smell pretty sweet to him. But I got quite a bit out of it myself. But I hope God had a good time. It looked like he did. <clears throat> but I feel like I grew a whole lot during that revival. There's things that 
I, I would, man, if I hadn't have been there, there was things that happened and things that were said and messages that was given out that I, I, I benefited so much by hearing, by just being there to hear it. We got victory. We heard that. Brother Rainer did a good job of preaching that about victory. Man. He was planning on was it Nathan? No. Jonathan. He was planning on winning either way. Yeah. Oh yeah. I never really caught that before. He said if if they say come up to us we're going to go up to him. But if, if they say not, then it didn't say nothing about them going home. It, it, they was planning on staying there and fighting, even if they did come back down to them. Because they was counting on God helping them. Victory is always an option. That was the message he preached. Victory is always an option. The guy's just waiting on somebody that's willing to fight. I'm willing to fight. I got a family to fight for. I got a wife to fight for. I got my own soul to fight for. The souls of all that are around me are lost, dying. And they're undone without God. And if I can't shine the light to them and let them see something that they can't see otherwise, then I'm responsible for their souls. I sure don't want to cause a reproach on God. On God's church. Boy, I feel I feel strongly. This is this is something that's in this last day and hour, if we don't get tight, if we don't get right with God and we make sure we hold on like we ain't never held on before. We're gonna have a time trying to hang on whenever the Think let's loose. Because we got times coming we're going to have to endure. And the time comes it says that men will not endure sound doctrine, but there are people out there that are hungry. There are people out there that are thirsty. And there's there's word in the Bible that says, Blessed is he that hungereth and thirst after righteousness. For he shall be filled. But we're carrying around what they need. We need to be ready to pour out for them. We need to be ready to deliver it to them. And Jesus broke the bread already. He already blessed it. He already handed it to us. He's just waiting on us to go pass it out. He said there's going to be a great increase. That's what that story was about. The great increase of the word. And understanding how that's, it's able to sustain all who come. No matter how big the crowd. Jesus already blessed it. He already broke it. And he already gave it to us. Now we just got to keep on passing it out. Every chance we get. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You got a song you want to say? You got a song you want to say? Uh, I don't want to change the old order of the service. Sister Lucy, you want to testify? We love God. Thank you for everything he's doing. It's good to be in God's house tonight. And we'll see what God can do. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Notice this carpet looks pretty good in here today. I'm going to find out. Terry bought Lucy a, a carpet shampoo. I said, she's bad my wife. I bought my wife a lot more. She's happy with it. She says, Lucy, come down and shampoo this carpet. She got stains out of this thing. I didn't think it was going to come out of it. But it looks good. So she <laughs> Hallelujah. But, uh, let me just kind of hit an announcement. Sir, I guess this is enough singing, but um, if I can get this right.
this coming Sunday. This is Destiny's birthday. So we're going to be wishing her happy birthday. Amanda is actually at her birthday. It's actually today, even though we had a party the other day. We got a. Brother Daniel Barber will be with us the 30th. That's next Thursday. So we'll just take up our mission offering then. I don't see much, but I, I hate to tell the missionary now I'll come. I believe God bless us the more we help him. But uh, Brother R.T. Owens will be with us the 14th. He preached down here a while back. Brother Dakota Owsley came to be with us and brought it with him. Yeah, I really enjoyed the message. So I'm praying, Lord. Be with him as he comes by. He's going to be preaching somewhere else. And I'm going to stop on by and be with us the 14th. So let's be in prayer for some of these things. I, I know, you know, sometimes God sends a man by for a specific reason. Sometimes for a purpose. Sometimes it could just be one person in the church that needs something. But it, usually every one of us needs something out of the message. But let's be in prayer for these things. I want to see God do a work. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I'm going to be teaching on a little subject here. Besetting sins. Does anybody know what a besetting sin is? <laughs> These are sins that take control of your life while you are just sitting there while you just be sitting there minding your own business. No, I couldn't help it. That's not what a besetting sin is. But, uh, Hebrews, I hope by the time we're done here, we've got an idea what besetting sins are. There's there's some things that come out of this verse of Scripture. Sometimes, some of it, I believe, this speaks to the false doctrine comes out of it. But there is truth in everything in the Word of God. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, just one verse of Scripture, <coughs> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, and he can be seated. Now we just come off of a Hebrews chapter 11, which we call the faith chapter. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen, but through Throughout this chapter, he goes through all these patriarchs, and all these men of old that went through great trials and come out victorious. And then he comes to Hebrews chapter 12, and he starts out at verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's all those in, in uh, chapter 11. But also, in this day and time, we got a great cloud of witnesses, people that have been through some things that can give some testimony, tell us how to get by the situations in our lives that we don't know how to handle. Hallelujah. It said, let us lay aside every weight, hallelujah, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run this race with patience, hallelujah, that's set before us, hallelujah. We gotta have patience. The Bible tells us, "In your patience, possess ye your souls." Yeah. All right. So we gotta be patient. And, you know, in this day and time, we want everything right now. Uh, it's right now, society. But you can't always have everything right now. We try to teach our kids that. Some of us, while we're growing up, some of of us are still trying to teach our kids that. Some wives are probably trying to teach their husbands that. My wife said, "I'm the only kid she's got that won't grow up and leave home." I don't know if that's good or bad. 
But uh, let us lay aside every weight. These weights are, are anything that we put before our service to God. It can be our attitudes and our spirits. You know, people have trouble letting go of pride. Some people just don't want nobody telling them what to do. And that could be something that you're putting before God. Uh, it can be our job. It can be our home. It can be a hobby. It can be possessions. Anything that you allow to interfere with your service to God is a way. <clears throat> Things we don't need to be carrying around. You know, when I started riding bicycles some of that stuff I thought was crazy but I could understand the mentality of it these bicycle riders would cut I mean fractions of an ounce off their frame by, by nipping off the end of a little screw that sticks out a little farther than it needs to and just all kind of little things because races are won by milliseconds and they don't want any extra weight anything that's going to catch wind and drag and cause them to lose any time at all I thought, boy, they're crazy. And they had these little, mini skinny bicycle seats there, you know. And I tried to go along with the no weight for a while, but when they had that kind of seat on that bike I bought from Terry Brasher, I went and got me a swing super soft. I didn't care if it did weigh five pounds. I wasn't going to ride no bicycle for 40 miles on something about the size of a, of a microphone. <laughs> Hallelujah. But... Uh, we got to get rid of the weights. If it's hindering us from living to God, get rid of it. You know, I could, I could preach on a lot of things that we've preached about for several years, uh, things that we've preached against having and doing. But to be honest, if it's hindering you right now, like Brother Kevin was just saying, if it's going to cause us to stumble, we need to get rid of it. Drop it. It's not worth anything. You know, I see people that have carried things. I've been on hikes, you know, and we get to go, and go <sighs> I thought this rock was neat. And I was going to bring it home, but I ain't carrying it no more. we got to get that way with God. Get rid of the excess weights. The phrase, the sin which does so easily beset us, is greatly misunderstood. I've heard people say, we all have a besetting sin that we give into. That is an incorrect mentality. Yes, sir. That comes from the people who say, well, you got to sin a little bit every day. You can't live without sin. I don't know any sin that I have to do every day. I understand we're flesh, and we're going to mess up, and we're going to have to go to God in prayer. That's why the Bible tells us that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. His blood that was shed on the cross covers all of our sins that we had committed and all the ones that we will commit. And I hate to say it that way because I don't want to feel like I'm going to do anything to offend God. Hallelujah. But I'm thankful that he's made provision that if we do mess up. Well, you know, if, we, if it's already covered, then why worry about it? God forbid. It's an insult to God. Hallelujah. He died and shed his blood that we could be forgiven of our sins. I'm not going to do anything like that. Hallelujah. Uh, something that's besetting is a constant harassment or temptation. Not necessarily a sin that we fall prey to. Um, it's not something that we necessarily commit, but it's something that's constantly there. It's constantly hammering us. Now you know the devil knows what our weaknesses are. Someone asked the other day, does the devil, does the devil all know him? No, he's not. It's like Brother Jeremy said, after being around for thousands of years and putting things before people and watching their reaction, he knows what's going through your head. He's not all knowing. Hallelujah. You know, this is what God says about a besetting sin. You know, there's no sin that we have to commit. All right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. You 
haven't gone through anything new. If you're tempted by it, whether you fall or don't fall, it's not new. Hallelujah. It's common to all men. There's no new sin under the sun. There are many new avenues to go to those sins, but there's no new sin. Hallelujah. It's common to everyone. Hallelujah. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. He's not saying that you won't be tempted. All right? But he said, but we're with the temptation, so he's not taking it away. Also make a way to escape that ye may be able to what? Bear it. He's not taking it away, church. And there's a reason he's not taking it away. If it's a besetting sin, if it's something that constantly makes us have to choose whether we're going to live for God or we're going to follow the flesh, we're going to side with the carnal side, which is the God of this world, or side with the spirit, which is God himself, I'll leave it. there's a battle that's constantly going to be there. And there's a reason for that. If you're not ever tempted, if the devil is not bothering you, you better be praying. I'm telling you, because he feels like he's already got you. Hallelujah. This is how we overcome these besetting sins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. That's attitudes, that's spirits, that's sins. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us to make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The Bible also tells us that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. That's not the Holy Ghost is talking about. It's that carnal spirit that you started out with before you received the Holy Ghost. And whether we feed the flesh or we feed the spirit determines what kind of Christian, what kind of person we're going to be. I'm not going to say Christian because if you're feeding the flesh, that's not a Christian. Hallelujah. And spirit. Now wait a second. All filthiness of the flesh and spirit is not talking about the Holy Ghost here. No, it's not. That's talking about the spirit of a man. Hallelujah. The carnal spirit that's in us. We've got to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh. Don't feed this flesh. If you know it's going to cause trouble, if you know it's just going to lead up to something, Stay away from it. And spirit. Spirits, attitudes, motives. we got to be careful what we allow ourselves to partake of. we got to be careful what we allow to go on in our mind. But Brother Ray, you know, I can't stop it. It seems like the devil just keeps putting this thought in my mind. Well, the devil might put that thought in your mind. But you do not have to entertain it. Singing in songs. Songs. And spiritual hymns, get your mind on good things. Think on these things. What sort of things are good, what sort of things are pure, what sort of things are... Don't allow yourself to think on bad things. Hallelujah. And you won't be troubled near as much because you aren't allowing this stuff to, to affect you. It says perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's not terror of God. That's reverential fear like I was teaching on earlier this year. Hallelujah. A reverence for God. Uh, a reverential fear that says within us, I don't want to do anything for my God. Hallelujah. I respect Him too much. I love Him too much. I want to stay in His will, in His presence. That's perfecting holiness. You're not going to be perfect in this world. I'll just tell you that. But as long as you're striving for that, God looks at it like it is. When the Bible talks about us being perfect, because he is perfect, he knows we're flawed in the flesh. But as long as you're striving to that end, God is looking at you like you're in perfection. Hallelujah. Besetting sins are 
sins that the devil knows have a grip on them. What affects one person doesn't necessarily affect somebody else. Now he knows what you can be tempted by. And I praise God for it, but I, I, the devil isn't going to come up and try to tempt me. He's going to go, I don't have no desire for it. He's not going to have any luck tempting me to go out and get drunk. I don't have a desire for that anymore, and I thank God for it. But there are certain things that each one of us might have a problem with, and the devil knows it, and that's what he's going to put in the way. And he may leave you alone for a long time. I have a lot of people asking questions about that. I, I, I give in sometimes to a certain sin, other times I defeat it. It depends on how fleshly you get yourself or carnally minded you allow yourself to be is usually when you fall. Excuse me. Or how spiritually minded you are that, that makes you able to overcome it. Right? But I mess up again and again and again. Well, God's making provision for you to overcome those things. Hallelujah. we got to stay Close to God. We got to have the fear of God in our life. I know the devil knows some things, and he can put some stuff on you. He can put temptation. He may come at you and just bombard you with it. If he doesn't get anywhere, he'll leave you alone for a while, and he'll come back. And if he still doesn't get anywhere, he'll leave you alone for a lot longer time. And he'll leave you alone for so long, you'll think he's done forgot about it, but then he's going to come back strong. And he's going to try to get you to fall again. And whether we stay prayed up or keeping the spiritual side fed is what determines whether or not we're going to fall. Hallelujah. Why would God allow this type of temptation to come upon us? There must be a reason. He just got through saying he's going to make a way that you can bear it not saying, oh, I'll fix this. You won't never have to deal with that again. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with it. Why does he allow this? This next setting of scripture is, is dealing with a physical thorn in the flesh. But I can't rule out altogether that it's dealing with the spiritual. But the principle of being strengthened remains the same. And this is dealing with why God allows us to be tempted in this way or have to deal with what the Bible calls a besetting sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, and I'm going to read down through verse 10. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. And we know from different comments that he's made, God has revealed some unbelievable things to Paul in the Spirit. And a lot of people would get puffed up, you know, spiritually, like. Oh, I'm really something. See all these things I know that God don't show anybody else. All right? He said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, some people say it's a physical affliction. Uh, you know, maybe some kind of handicap, maybe a vision problem, a speech problem, or, you know, something. But it... I really don't see that it's necessarily something physical. Because he goes on to say, uh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Alright? Lest I should be exalted above measure. I really feel like God's giving Paul a battle here with something he's having a problem with. And he's asking God to take it from him and God's saying no. He said, you're going to have to deal with it. Verse 8 says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, or three times, that it might depart from me. He's not referring to being healed of it. He wants it to leave. And he said unto me, this is God speaking, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's why we're allowed to go through a battle. All right. He goes on his way. It's not just 
God's strength. God's not ruler so he can be strong. Okay? He says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You can have power to overcome these things. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. It's not saying, Boy, I just really like having all these problems. You know, something breaks down every time I turn around. Just, you know, I got health problems. I got all that. No, he's not saying it. He just loves it. But if it's going to make him closer to God. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. He's not saying he enjoys it. Hallelujah. But he knows it's working something. And he goes on to say right here, For when I am weak, then am I made strong. And he put the made in there, I did. Then am I strong. Hallelujah. God allows us to go through some things because it strengthens us spiritually. Like Brother Campbell was just saying, and Sister Mac, Brother, Sister Rick, Ray. <laughs> I said a lot of times, you can't run with the footman. What are you going to do when the horseman come? How are you going to deal with it? You've got to build some strength here. You've got to be able to trust the Lord for some things. You've got to be able to pray and get in touch with God. That's what it's talking about when it talks about lay aside every weight. These things that get in the way when you need to drop down on your knees right now and really pray because of a right now situation. Are you distracted by all these weights? Are you hindered by all these weights? Or have you kept yourself up spiritually enough that when you drop down, you can instantly get in touch with God? We're going to have to be ready, church. It's coming. It's coming. And God wants us to be strengthened to be able to deal with situations like that, that he can use us when the time comes. But that's like I said a lot of times. This isn't a hobby. It's not a pastime. It's not a recreation. It's a way of life living for God. And if it's not a way of life to you, I'll say it again. You're not going to make it. This has to be a way of life. Everything about us centers around God. Not God is fit in wherever we can manage to, to put him here and there to fit our lifestyle. He has to be first. He will not accept any other situation. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, I've already read this, but I'm dealing with a different part of it, maybe a little bit. So it said, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And that's the problem right there. The part right there I want to get at. You're going to have to be able to bear it. You're going to have to be able to take control. So many times we do things and mess up, and the devil says, you just want to give up. You can't make it. Oh, that's the time you need to take control and realize, look, God has made a way for this. I just haven't been doing what I should be doing, and I need to start seeking God. And you will be able to take control of the situation. We can't dwell on our past failures. We've got to look ahead and strive to go on and live for God. We can't look back at the past. Hallelujah. I know the devil's always there trying to pull some kind of trick. You know, I've had problems. You go on a new job and you want to fit in. If you're not careful, you'll find wind up saying and doing things to kind of make you fit in instead of making sure they know right from the very start where you stand on living for God. Hallelujah. We've got to make a stand. Hallelujah. Now, the two opinions that come out of this verse of Scripture about the sin which does so easily be said, I said both of them are really false doctrine. One is we can achieve sinless perfection. We strive for perfection, but you will never be sinless. I don't take that wrong. I'm not giving you a license to sin. But you will never be completely 
not carnal. There will always be something there you will have to deal with. That's what we're talking about this whole time. He's making a way you can bear it, all right? But to be perfect, not ever bothered by any kind of sin, never committed any kind of sin anymore from the time, and there's preachers out there making it sound like that. Well, the Holy Ghost that I got won't ever let me do that. Yeah, I have to think the Holy Ghost that you got to allow me to have some bad attitudes, too. We got to be careful, church. All right, and I'll explain myself here in a minute. I don't want to get the wrong idea here. Okay, one is sinless perfection, and the other is this is my cross. <coughs> I'm going to have to bear it. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, I got to sin a little bit every day. That's false doctrine. Right. All right, that verse of scripture is not saying that no matter what you do, you're going to be guilty of sin. You do not have to sin every day. If you did, there'd be no point in the Bible telling you to strive for perfection. They're both lies. Okay? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Well, that shoots this my cross out of war. Hallelujah. It'll cleanse us from all sin. There's no sin that you have to commit. There's no sin that you have to give in to. That deal about this is my cross, and you know, we're just human, and we got a sin, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. I don't like that attitude. That's crazy. And it's not, not right according to the Word of God. Verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Sinless perfection. It's a lie, church. You allow yourself to feel like you can get to the point where you will never mess up. And when you mess up, what's the use? I can't live it. I'm telling you. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, well, if we were sinlessly perfect, there wouldn't be no sins to confess, for one thing. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. We have an advocate with the Father. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Hallelujah. I realize I've got a constant battle. I realize I have to feed the spiritual man because I'm nothing without God. Now, I like what Brother Pazuki used to always say. He said, you know, Lord, if you don't help me, I'm not going to make it. Because I can't make it on my own. It's through His power. Hallelujah. Praise God. The only person the Bible describes as sinless is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him. Okay? Not by our own perfection, not by our own deeds, but in him we can have this. Hebrews 4 and 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows what you're going through. But was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet without sin. 1 Peter 2 and 22. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Every other major character in the Bible is flawed by sin. All, Moses, Abraham. They've all had their shortcomings. Peter, David. Any of them. Hallelujah. God called David a man after his own heart. Why? Because of David's attitude in the spirit. When he messed up, he sought God for forgiveness. He sought God for help. To help him not to do the same thing again and again. I mean, it is not God's will for you to be a slave to any form of ungodliness. He doesn't want you to be bound by these things. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be indeed 
for it to be yeah. dead indeed unto sin. That word is actually can be translated truly. You yourselves to be dead truly unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's through him. I can't stress that enough. It's not by our own ability. If we're trying to do it on our own, you can't do it. It's through Jesus Christ. He shed his blood. And he's made a process and a way that when we do mess up, we can come boldly before the throne and confess our sins. And the Bible said he was faithful to forgive. Hallelujah. Let not sin therefore reign or have rule or govern in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. If you're having problems with the same thing again and again and again, you're allowing your flesh to be exposed to things that lead up to it. Yes. You're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Yes, the reason you commit certain sins is because you like it. I'm just making a plan, okay? I mean, we're human. The only reason you give in to sin is because it's something you like. And if you keep falling for it again and again, it's because you're allowing yourself to stay so carnally minded that you can't overcome it. It doesn't mean you'll not ever be tempted by it again. He's made a way you can bear it. Hallelujah. But we've got to overcome. Hallelujah. You can't let it rain. But you should obey it in the lust thereof. Thus, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's just the way it works. We allow ourselves carnally to dwell too much on the lust thereof. Well, this ain't sin yet. You know it's leading to it. You better leave it alone. Because it is sin if you willingly allow yourself to do a situation or put yourself in a situation where you're constantly going to be tempted to do something you know better. Hallelujah. It says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. I don't want to be an instrument the devil can use to cause me to fall, to cause someone else to fall. Hallelujah. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It, it just goes right back to what I was talking about the other night about the God of this world or the kingdom of God that's not of this world. Which one are you going to follow? Which one are you going to be part of? If you're going to be an instrument, let it be a proper Verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Under the law, you just had a list of rules and regulations, and you had to make choices, and that's the end of it. But under grace, you have the Holy, Glo Holy Ghost dwelling in your heart, and it helps you overcome these things. What then? Shall we sin because we are uh, not under the law? But under grace, God forbid. Hallelujah. There's no loophole for this. You're not supposed to sin. Hallelujah. There has been a way made that you can overcome, but God forbid we go ahead and sin anyway, just because we know we can be forgiven. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, that's where it's going, or of obedience unto righteousness. How many times have you seen Jesus make the statement, they that obey? Hallelujah. Whole duty of man, serve God, keep his commandments. Hallelujah. We've got to be obedient to God if we're going to make it. Verse 17 said, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. That was out in the world. But ye have overmet. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Hallelujah. That's this truth. That's this plan of salvation. That's repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ 
and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's just the base. That's just the foundation of it all. We've got to grow from there, and it helps us to overcome the things of the world. Hallelujah. was delivered to you. Verse 18 says, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. That's not saying that you no longer have any problem with sin. But you came to the place of repentance and now, oh no, 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 that's sin, I'm turning around going the other way. That's being made free from sin. Hallelujah. You became the servants of righteousness. When you see something that's not right, no, Lord, I'm not going that way. I know you don't want me to. I'm going to do this. I'm going to serve you. All right? Now, the rest of our scripture text, I read verse 1, and I'm going to close with this. I want to read verses 2 through 11. And it might take me a minute or two to go it, but honest, I'm closing. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who's the author? Jesus. Who's the one that starts writing your story? That's Jesus. Who's the one that's going to finish the story? That's Jesus. Maybe. You can still take that pen. And you can change the story if you want to. But he knows the end from the beginning. And you would be smart to allow God to keep writing the story no matter how bad the storyline seems to be getting. It will always be what's best. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What he went through, the blood he shed, the stripes he bore, the bruises he took on himself, do you think he's likely going to just mess up your story? He died for you. Any one of you here tonight, if you were the only one that would ever be saved, he would have died on the cross just for you. He loves you that much. I don't want to hurt him. Hallelujah. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. He's our example. Ye have not yet resisted on the blood striving against sin. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. You're not just some idle creature running around out there. He considers you his child. My son, Despise not the chastening of the Lord. Now, a lot of people don't like that. You know what chastening is? My dad used to chasten me with a double over leather belt. And you know what? I can't say I like it. But now that I look back, it done me a lot of good. I'm not going to despise the chastening of the Lord. He considers me a child. Hallelujah. And I want to keep that position as a child. You can reject it. But you won't be his child. You won't make it to heaven. You are going to face punishment for the things you have done wrong one of two places. As a child of God, you're either going to suffer the punishment here and thank God for every time I've been chastened. Because the only other alternative is through eternity. And if you wait till then to face punishment, it's going to be hell forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son he receiveth. When you come into the house of God, when you repent of your sins, get baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, you become part of the bride. You become his child. Hallelujah. If ye endure chastity, okay, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastity,
God deal with, with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, if you're going to be a child, you know, I'm going to stop right here. You know, I, I knew a situation. Foster children. But when Newman, he took in a couple of children, foster children, him and Rachel. They give her a list of do's and don'ts. They said, now you can't, you can't spank these children. He said, stop right there. He said, if your kid comes over to my house, they're going to obey me while they're here. Or I'm going to whoop them. And he said, and if these kids don't obey me, I'm going to whoop them. And if you don't like it, then it's over right now. I said, well, well, you know, no, 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 we can understand your proper discipline, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, Hallelujah. Without discipline, there is never going to be any order. A child doesn't have fun without some kind of discipline. Yeah, they, they may think they're having fun when they get all the other kids to laugh because they're cutting up in school and making fun and trying to cause trouble for the teachers or whoever. That's not fun. Hallelujah. They need discipline. He said, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, if you're going to be in the household of God, there's going to be chastisement. And if you don't want to be part of that, he goes on to say, then are ye bastards and not sons. Do you know what it means to be a bastard? I know we use it, people use it as a cuss word. But a bastard is simply someone that has no idea who their father is. Technically, they don't have a father because they don't know who he is. And that's what God just said. I'm not going to be your father unless you're willing to be chastised by me so I can keep you going in the right direction. Hallelujah. Because like I said, without the chastisement, you're going to be punished either here or in eternity. Thank you, Lord, for right now. Hallelujah. Furthermore, we've had, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastised us after their own pleasure. That doesn't mean they enjoyed beating on the kid. Okay? That means that they've done it so they can bring peace to the household. Okay? But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You're not going to have fruit without work. Go out there and plant your garden, and never weed it, never fertilize it, never water it, never do nothing. If you get something, it ain't going to be much. You take a fruit tree and you plant it. And you don't ever do anything to it. You're not going to get much off of it. I remember when Brother Henson started planting all these fruit trees around his yard. And I remember him talking to some of these guys. Man, there ain't nothing on it, man. Everything I got is wormy. He said, man, you got to spray it while it's in bloom. He said, because those bugs laid their larva in the bloom. And when the fruit grows... The worm is inside the apple. When you see the damage to an apple or a worm coming out of the apple, it's too late. No brother Dwight Austin at the time called his brother. He did a demonstration on an apple. And he was saying, he was showing us how nice it looked and everything, but when you roll over the other side, there's a hole where a worm come out. He said, when you see the worm, it's too late. Because what's going to happen? You're going to eat that apple, and you're going to find the worm while you're eating it because you haven't come out yet. It's corrupted fruit. If you want good fruit, you are going to have to work at it. It's going to take work. He goes on to say, Yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 
got to learn to bear it. In your weakness, he's made strong. When you go through trials and temptations, and you learn to overcome, then you're made strong. And you're bringing forth fruit unto righteousness. Why, why would God want to put you through something like that so you could become like gold refined in fire? Why would he, would a man throw his gold into fire and melt it to get the impurities out of it? And that's why God allows us to go through the fire so we can get the impurities out that we can go to be with him one day and stand with him. Uh, I hope somebody got something out of this. Praise God. But we don't have to give in to what people call the besetting sins. Hallelujah. It's a constant temptation. It's a harassment. Hallelujah. But it doesn't necessarily have to be something we give in to again and again and again. They can be overcome. Praise God. Hallelujah. I've made all the announcements. And I'm thankful for everybody that's here tonight. And I ask you to be much in prayer about things that come in the future. Try to do some things. I know I said something about trying to have some Bible studies. If somebody wants has a certain subject or something they want to study on, you want to meet here like on Monday or something. Uh, the evening sometime if you want to, we'll, we'll get together and study on that subject. Whoever, how many want to do it? You know, is it one of you? Two or three of you? I'd like to be able to do that. And we'll try to get some other things organized here. Like I said, I'm, I'm trying to work on retirement. Please be in prayer with me about that. You know, if the Lord's willing, I'm going to try to get away from the bondage of work where I can do more at church and for God, spend some more time praying and different things. Hallelujah. I want to draw closer to God. I want to see God move in this town. Praise God. Sister Rose, you got something you want to play? I take it. Let's worship God. Oh, okay. <laughs>